Good afternoon. As you can see, we have a really big hall, and we don't have a lot of people. Could we ask those of you who are here on the outskirts to come in a little closer so that we can be a little bit more intimate, that we can take advantage of, of that uh, and not having to look around quite so much? We'll be starting in just a minute. Good afternoon. So good to have you here with us today. I uh, hope you've had a good time. You've learned some good things, had some good experiences here, and we've got more to go. So we're pretty excited about this today. This is going to be a very interesting session and a lot, some interesting things. The, the genesis of this session really started uh, about three years ago when, uh, when, uh, when Lloyd was uh, the director of communications and marketing for Ashto. And Elizabeth was the uh, manager, director of strategic communications for the Utah Department of Transportation. The one thing they had in common that year was Carlos Braceras, who was the head of both. And so th they, during that period of time, they started a, a study. They started work on a project and, and a study to kind of discover how do we communicate the benefits of transportation investments? How do we communicate the benefits in, term, in, a, in terms of quality of life, of the things that really matter to people and make sure people understand them within that context. And so the, uh, a great study was undertaken and that's gonna be sort of the basis of, of their discussion here today. Now, I think probably you all know Lloyd. Uh, uh, Lloyd has been, uh, was 11 years with Ashto as a d director of marketing and communications. He's now with HDR uh, based in Phoenix and doing work on marketing and strategic communications. So, uh, and, and Elizabeth is the director of strategic communications still for UDOT. Now, that's, those are words and titles and they're great. These are two of the most brilliant communication strategists I've ever known, both of them. And, and so we're gonna get the benefit of a, a lot of good thinking here. And so I won't, you can, if you want to read more about them, there probably will be books published about them at some point in time. But right now you can read a paragraph in, in, in the, uh, on which, which you can download from the internet. But uh, we'll turn the time over to them. Thanks, Joe. All right. Well, uh, so I'm going to, I'll talk first and then uh, Elizabeth will, will uh, fill in uh, the Utah piece of the story. We're going to talk today really about a narrative, about telling stories, and about having a better understanding of what it is that you're really talking about uh, in that standard press release that you do. The language of transportation, uh, at least for highway and bridge builders, has long been about making the bridge and the road the hero. And so today we're going to talk, hopefully, uh, about some ways that we can maybe redirect some of that focus so that we have a different hero in the story. We're going to talk about knowing the hero in your story. Uh, what is it that you really want to focus on? And then we're going to talk about the research that's going to support uh, a little bit about why you want to try and reframe some of the narrative. We'll give you some practical examples. And in some of those practical examples, at least one of the practical examples, we have changed the names to protect the innocent. 
Uh, but these are real examples that we're going to go through. And hopefully you'll see the value of one way versus the other. Uh, I told Elizabeth the other day that, that since we started working on this project several years ago and really coming to understand the focus, I call it focus on the benefits, but really focus on the users of the system, I feel a lot like Don Quixote in the windmills, that I see the press releases, I see the videos, I see the way that uh, people talk about transportation, and I just want to run over and help them, uh, you know, have a different way of, of telling the stories. And then we'll finish up with some questions and answers. But first, again, I want to just start with knowing the hero of the story. Uh, one of the things I heard several years ago uh, here in the rooms uh, was that uh, too often with engineers, the customer is the bridge or the customer is the road. And th so the news release will come out and it'll say something like, the $400 million project will widen 10 miles of the interstate and this much concrete and this much steel and this, these contractors. And there's not a single person in any of the, any of the stories. So what I wanna do here is take a couple of, take an opportunity to look at a couple of examples of storytelling, and then we can reflect on who we think the hero of the story is. So let's start first with this one, one of my favorites. And if you're in the transportation industry, you may have seen this commercial. Domino's delivery drivers are experts at handling bad roads. But those roads shouldn't ruin your pizza when you carry out. So we're doing something about them, starting with this one. If your drive home is rough on pizza, tell us at pavingforpizza.com so we can fix roads across the country. Then carry out large three-topping pizzas for $7.99 each. All right, what do you think? Potholes are not that big a deal, right? Dominoes can fix them. Why can't we fix them? <laughs> so in this, in this uh, video, who is the hero or what is the hero of the story? What's the most important thing that they're trying to tell you? It's the pizza. But what's the pizza represent? The pizza represents the experience. The, you know, the, the people who are, you know, it's about the people, their customer. And if you're having a bad time getting home from work, we're gonna come and help you so that you can enjoy your pizza, okay? So it's, it's, it's not about the pothole. It's about what's interrupting your opportunity to experience your evening with your family. Friday night, movie night. You can't get there, you lost your tire, you know, in a pothole in Tumwater, right? That never happens, right? Um, but, uh, but yeah, so that, I mean, that's what that's about. Let's take a look at another one. Charlie's Produce is an employee-owned company. We have approximately 1,000 employees. Uh, we sell produce throughout the Pacific Northwest, Alaska, and parts of Western Canada. We sell an array of uh, produce items, uh, from conventional to organic products, um, to restaurants, uh, grocery stores, institutions, the marine industry, uh, and other wholesalers. Well, being a highly perishable business produce, it, you know, it, it's not a can of beans, it's, it's fresh. So our customers are very reliant on us to be timely, efficient, safe, and consistent. It's a big deal for us. Uh, transportation and logistics and the ability for us to move products in and out of our facilities is crucial. If we don't have a good cost-effective way of getting goods throughout our state, the economy is affected. Washington's a huge agricultural state. Our farmers are reliant on shipping overseas to other countries as well as within the United States and within our own state. Uh, we need to keep those tax dollars here and those businesses here to be able to, to have a good growing economy. We here at Charlie's Hill is really important to, to support this freight plan. It's in our best interest as well as our customers' best interest. And bottom line, triples all the way down to the consumer and everybody out there. Without this, uh, we're going to pay more for goods, uh, and jobs are going to go away, and the economy is going to be affected by it. All right. 
Well, first, thanks to Washington State DOT for using their video. Roger, thank you for letting me uh, play. Or actually, you didn't let me. I just pulled it off your YouTube. So, um, But tell me who the hero is there. Anyone? The freight haulers, right, the people who use the system. And what did he say? He said, we need, without an efficient way of getting our product to market, our economy is going to suffer and people won't get their fresh produce. And so it's about the people using the system. I ha there, th this is part of a series of videos. I think there were three, maybe four. There were three and then a fourth one was maybe cut off the three. But it's about a freight plan. I'm sorry, I've been around transportation 20 years. Some of the most boring documents I've ever read <laughs> are freight plans. But this is not about a freight plan. This is about how freight moves in the system and why we need to have a plan to make that happen. Do you see the difference? Okay, so I know it's a lot of extra work, but let me take you through the research that shows us, uh, that, that shows us why we need to be thinking this way. Why is it important? I mean, sure, it's, it's one thing to say, yeah, Lloyd, that's a great idea for us to have a different narrative, but why is it important? So over the course of about 10 years uh, through the NCHRP program, we did a series of research projects that, that landed about every three years, two and a half, three years. And this one, NCHRP 2301, Communicating the Economic and Quality of Life Benefits of Transportation. <laughs> Clearly, we weren't thinking about the end user when we wrote that title. Uh, Elizabeth was on the oversight panel for that one, and uh, WSP did the research work on it. But what we did, uh, uh, and I was the Ashto liaison for this project, we looked at uh, the economic and quality of life benefits of 80 different case studies uh, compiled for the research. There were several themes that we identified through that. Then we tested those themes uh, used by state DOTs and other organizations. There was a sentiment analysis on social media. Uh, we went to Transcom, which is the Committee for Transportation Communications through AASHTO, and we did a focus group there. And then we did, there was a, a public survey through SurveyMonkey. And what came out of that was really uh, identified some key themes that really resonated with people uh, the, the, uh, that made them more likely to support transportation investment, more likely to support transportation funding. And, and by focusing on these themes, you were more likely to be able to uh, increase support for your organization. So those themes really came down to talking about transportation in a way um, so that investment in transportation gives you more control over your time. It was a time element. In fact, this was the number one theme that resonated with people. Time really mattered. The more time you can have to do those things. And you know what? This was done before COVID, but what did COVID show us? Working remotely, all the articles now we've seen, two extra hours a day, three extra hours a day. You know, I'm reading books. I'm spending more time with my kids. Time really matters with people. So when we're talking about transportation, if you can fit time in there, that really helps. Uh, helping you get around more easily. Transpor investment in transportation helps you move more easily. This is a long-running theme uh, that goes all the way back to, you know, when we first tested this, it really represents the sense of freedom and a connectedness so that you can move from one mode, say you're on a bicycle and you go to, and you get on a bus, but you, and then, and you want to see all of these modes interact and link and connect. It's a sense of freedom and choice. So getting around more easily. Uh, less friction in your in your movements, uh, making your commute less stressful. Obviously, commuting is maybe not as much of a priority. Probably wouldn't test as highly post COVID. This was pre COVID. But uh, talking about transportation investments in ways that reduce the stress around your commute, uh, your uh, uh, commute, and finally, uh, it's an economic message, economic theme, the creation of jobs. But the important thing, and this was stressed over and over again. Uh, by the WSP researchers is it's not just any economic activity. Talking about investment in transportation, esoterically sort of big picture, it's going to increase the economy, is not a winner. It's not. It goes back to exactly what I've been talking about here for the last few minutes, is it's, it has to be a personal connection. So when you talk about investment in your community, 
and, and economic improvements, it's economic improvements in your community, in your county, in this neighborhood. It's very specific to how it affects the end user, okay? All right, so that's the setup, that's the research. Now you're thinking about heroes. I'm gonna turn this over to my colleague here, Elizabeth, and she'll take it over from here. Oh, no, but I do need that, oh, yes, thank you. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the importance of well-being and quality of life for us as transportation professionals, because I think that sometimes the reason we forget to talk about it is because we forget to think about it. Purpose is what drives us. So we had that question that Polly answered this morning. And the question was, what about transportation gets you out of bed in the morning? That's a question about purpose. So she talked about access, she talked about jobs, she talked about the economy. This is the quality of life framework for Utah. This is our mission statement, enhance quality of life through transportation. You can obviously see how what Polly said fits right into that framework. And the reason that we came up with this is that we wanted four distinct dimensions of quality of life so that we could talk about it, not esoterically, not as this amorphous, immeasurable thing, but it gives us common language and it helps us think about what those elements of purpose are. So I'm gonna just tell you a quick story. I have a Master's of Applied Positive Psychology from the University of Pennsylvania, and I had to do a capstone project. And Coming up with the capstone project is like this notoriously terrible project. It's hard for people to figure it out. Uh, but lucky for me, I had a really great idea. And it was about the relationship between cat videos and weight loss. And I will not get into all the details, but it was really creative and I thought it was gonna be very fun. And unfortunately for me, the head of the program encouraged me constructively to maybe focus on something that was more in my wheelhouse, like the relationship between well-being and transportation. That was really disappointing to me. I still think that there's room in this world to explore the relationship between cat videos and weight loss. I think it's a thing. But that is not what we are here to talk about today. So I was driving along in my car thinking about my great idea and how to convince Marty Seligman that I should do this, and it was slow going. I was in stop and go traffic and I was on my way to pick up my son. Now at his school, they charge you $5 per minute if you're late to pick up. So I really try not to be late. I'm late for almost everything else in my life, but I am not late for that. I don't wanna pay $5 a minute. I don't wanna embarrass him. The people at the front desk are very judgy when they are waiting to get out of there. And I was just thinking, I cannot wait until this project that they're building is over. This is gonna be so much less stressful. And that's when I realized that Marty was right. I should be focusing on this. And not just for my capstone project, but for what I'm doing with my life and my career. What we do really impacts well-being. And I say this for all of us who are in transportation so that when you go back to a project and when you're listening to a complaint from a stakeholder or when you're stuck in design, you remember that it matters. So this right here is data from the World Happiness Report that was released. It was for data on 2020. And you can see a couple of things. This is the highlights from a long list of factors. The question they're trying to answer is, what are the factors that influence quality of life the most, that influence well-being and happiness? So long list, these are the highlights, and you can see a couple of things that we've already talked about. Lloyd mentioned freedom. That's right up there. Uh, counting on friends. That's connection. We need to be able to get to our friends. If there's anything we learned over the last year, it's that we really love being with family and friends. Institutional trust is an interesting one to me. I would not have guessed that it would be that high, that it would have that level of significance, but it does. Now in positive psychology, there are three arenas that we talk about for positivity. They are emotions, positive emotions, positive relationships, and positive institutions, specifically government. So for those of us who are in government, that's amazing. We have the opportunity to move the needle like that, to move it systemically. And when I say government, I just also want to acknowledge that we've got some great contractors and consultants here. You are all government too. The way I think about it in Utah is anyone who's out on the road working, and a lot of that is private contractors, they are the face of Utah. Any PI consultant who's out talking to people, they are the face of Utah. Anyone designing a project is purposely not showing their face to anyone, but they are designing our projects. 
So it's important for us to establish trust as an institution. So then the next question is how do we do that? Uh, there's a trust equation that I like a lot and it includes reliability, credibility, self-orientation, and intimacy. And that's where we're gonna talk today is intimacy. And it's not like intimacy, it's connection. <laughs> it's connecting with people. Uh, so, Lloyd mentioned that part of our goal with the NCHRP study and its related document was something that was actionable, that was user-friendly, despite its title, and that you could go after reading it and develop materials that are easy and effective. So we're just gonna go through a couple of things. Um, but first, I just wanna spend a couple of minutes talking about brains. The human brain is a mysterious thing. And there is so much that we do not understand about it. Like you think you know what you think, but you don't. Like you literally don't know the half of it, you know like a third of it. The part of your brain that does the thinking is the part of your brain that likes data. We like to talk about data. We like to talk about lane miles. We like to talk about lane widening. That's the thinking part of your brain. It also likes logic. It does reasoning. It's the part of your brain that knows that a double blueberry donut is 400 calories. And its logic sounds like this. The donut equals 400 calories. 400 calories equals one hour and 22 minutes of brisk walking, pa or brisk paced walking. Then there's the other two thirds of your brain and it's the part that says, uh, the logic is like this, fat plus sugar equals eat donut. And that's the part we need to talk to is the donut loving part because we can't even get in the door without the donuts. So now we're gonna talk about storytelling. You can see that we've got the facts on the right and that is a very short list. It is an important list. I am not proposing that we get rid of the data that we all love so much. I am a self-professed data geek. I'm not making anyone give up data, but we do need to focus on the emotional side. So we've already got the four messages that Lloyd talked about, and then we're gonna talk about these four elements of good storytelling, and then at the bottom, that's one format that makes effective stories. So we won't go over the proven messages because we've already done that. They're the four that Lloyd shared with us. Next is living characters. And you'll notice that Lloyd said the hero is not the project. Projects aren't characters. Characters are people. They're living, thinking, feeling beings. Next, they have personal and specific details. So how many of you were at the reception last night? Excellent, okay. So one way that you could talk about it was, I enjoyed the reception last night. But a better way you could talk about it was, I had so much fun at the reception last night, even though the music was a little bit loud, it was offset by the delicious tomahawk steak. Specific and personal. Okay, and then authentic emotions. You wanna make it relatable. We trust people who feel the things that we feel. And another thing to keep in mind is that even though it's really easy as humans to focus on the negative, we do that, the things that are most effective in moving us emotionally are actually positive emotions. So love, pride, gratitude, joy. Once we've established that, then we get to talk about facts. And a way that we can do it, this format that's at the bottom there, is normal, explosion, new normal. That sounds um, possibly inapproachable. This is not, it's just a typical before and after. So imagine a before and after picture. That's what we're talking about here. So you have your before, that's normal life. The explosion, that's the thing that happens. In our case, it's often going to be the project. And then there's afterward, it's the new normal. And the new normal is better. The after picture should be better if you're doing good marketing. All right, so this is a video that we shared, and this is Ed Collins. He is an employee at the city of Lehigh, where I live, it's in Utah, and he's talking about a trail system in our area. He's got a pretty extraordinary story, so I'm gonna let him tell it. In 2015, I, I had, had weight loss surgery, and one of my goals as I was losing weight was to try to get physically active, and I thought, you know, I. If I can get back on a bicycle, I can ride back and forth to, to work. I decided that if sooner or later I was going to have to try to ride my bicycle down into the dry creek. 
basin and then get back up the other side. And my goal was to just do that without walking. If I can do that, then I can ride my bike to work. So that's, I started riding my bike to work and I, probably three days a week. I am really a timid bike rider and there's no way that I would have started riding my bike to work. I wouldn't even have had a thought that I could bicycle to work if there had not been a trail system. I was shocked when I started riding my bike down here at how many people I saw riding their bikes to the business park on the, on the Murdoch Trail. You know, I'm a 50-something year old guy and, I, and my life is completely different now than it was five years ago. If I can refashion myself and ride my bike to work, anybody can do it. The, the trails matter. I got the confidence to get back on a bicycle because I had a safe place to ride it. And if, if, that, if that system hadn't existed, I don't think I'd be on a bike today. All right, it's pretty powerful. All right, we've got our framework. Now we're gonna do a little bit of discussion about this. So the message that I hear from Ed is it will help you get around more easily. And it needed to be easy enough that it was a viable option for him for commuting. And it enabled that health element of the quality of life framework. He had personal and specific details. It's pretty personal to share that you've gone through bariatric surgery, so he's vulnerable from the very beginning. He shares the year of his surgery, it's 2015, so we're right there with him as a friend from the very beginning. He gives us literal before and after pictures with his cutout and with himself, and that allows us to infer two types of before and after, two types of normal and new normal. We see what he was before, someone he wasn't happy with, someone who wasn't healthy, and we see who he became. And we also hear how the transportation system, that trail network, made it possible for him to become even more that person, to maintain the results of his surgery and to be healthy. And then the other thing is, those might not have been familiar sites to you if you're not from Utah, but they are familiar sites to those of us who live there. They're trails that we've seen and ridden, they're backdrops that we know, and so that makes him relatable to us. And then we talked a bit about his authentic emotions of vulnerability, confidence, and gratitude. There is almost nothing more perfect gold than that video. It's a first person story, a literal testimonial. It's got the before and after. And those are the kinds of videos that we could use more of. We're pursuing right now doing even YouTube and Instagram style videos that are full on selfie camera that are raw, uncut, unproduced, because that's what people respond to right now. They, they don't trust government. They don't trust marketing campaigns. What they do trust is influencers. They trust their friends. They trust people that look and sound and feel like them. So we're creating those right now. Carlos recently gave us a very aggressive goal of producing three of those videos a week. So stand by, because when Carlos says, Elizabeth does. All right, we're going to take a look at another video. Now this one is produced and it's not first person. And so we're gonna look at how some storytelling works in a 15 second spot. All right, so this ad was from a 2021 campaign. We have had a program for a long time called TravelWise and it's really a mobility campaign. We're encouraging people to use six different travel behaviors like trip chaining, teleworking, shifted com commute times. So this specific one is trying to leverage the fact that people have been home and we're targeting the audience of people who have been working at home. So these are professionals who've been teleworking who could potentially continue to telework. So this is as people were starting to go back to offices, we didn't want them to lose that habit. We wanted them to keep it. And so you can see here that we're telling the story of this dad who's cooking for his family. Um, I don't know if you noticed, he puts too much sauce on the food and his wife like lovingly is like, thank you, I'll, I will take the plate now. Um, but you can hear his daughters talking and laughing. You can hear the pepper grinder. You can see the expressions on his face. It's gratitude from his wife. There's joy and pride on his face. And there's love in that room. You can relate to that. You want that time back, like Lloyd said. So even though this isn't Ed telling you a story, 
there's a new normal that's set out here. And all of us having lived the experience of teleworking and now trying to figure out this new normal, it resonates without a lot of work. And I will turn it back to Lloyd. All right. <clears throat> so we're going to go through a news release. This is an actual news release. And uh, we're going to go we're going to go through it. I can read it here. Hopefully you guys can read it on the screen. Uh, this is the actual headline. Um, uh, when you see DOT, it's the name of the DOT. OK, uh, so here it says DOT awards the largest project in its history. OK, the project will improve capacity and operation of interstate insert roadway. And then Dateline was the slug where the state capital where this was written from. And I'll just go through the lead, okay? The Department of Transportation has awarded the interstate widening project from near state route number to near state route number in the county of, uh, in the county to a contractor. The middle uh, home state contractor has the lowest bid of 160 million, the largest in DOT history, surpassing the 152 million interstate reconstruction project. What's missing in this news release? Okay, the why. Who's benefiting, right? There's no people in it. There, so this is really important information. My suggestion is that maybe this is in the second or third paragraph. That perhaps it should not be in the first paragraph. That as a, as a former newspaper writer, reporter, uh, a, a storyteller that I would have started with something and I'm suggesting that you think about starting with something that is more hooked around the themes that I identified for you that the research identified that I shared with you earlier uh, that have to do with time that have to do with uh, other things that matter to people sense of freedom and movement and connectedness uh, at when I was at Washington State, I'm sorry, when I was at AASHTO, how many jobs have I had? <laughs> um, when I was at AASHTO, we took this idea uh, and really tried to apply it. And what we did was we asked state DOTs from around the country uh, to share with us projects that, that they have been doing and with photos and, and send us a short summary, a short paragraph that focused on the benefits of the project itself. And in some cases, we had to really rewrite some of them and then send them back to the state and say, is this still, what, is, is this still the project that, that uh, you sent to us? And so it was a lot of work. But if you go now to the website benefits.transportation.org, there's a map. And you can search. And you can click on your state. You can click on the state of Utah. You can click on Colorado, any one of the states from Washto, And you can see projects from that state that's focused on the benefit that's being provided by the investment in transportation. Um, let's see, was there anything else I wanted to say? And there's one more video. The issue at uh, US 20 and Ward Hamby Road is there's been several severe uh, crashes and fatal crashes that have occurred. Um, there's been crashes over the years, so it's been one of our top crash sites. So we're looking at trying to implement uh, safety countermeasure that will help reduce those type of crashes and the severity. As the city of Bend grows, there's been a lot more traffic on US-20, especially at that intersection, just on the outskirts of the city. So ODOT's tried to do some uh, short-term safety countermeasures, as, as such as uh, lowering the speeds. The speed limit was raised to 65 miles per hour by the legislature outside the city of Bend. Um, we've tried to transition that speed down as you enter into the city. So we've moved the 45 mile an hour speed limit out east and a 55 mile, mile an hour zone all the way out to Dodds Road. Um, also, we've implemented systemic sign upgrades, which is large intersection ahead signs on both the side streets and the main line to warn drivers that they're coming into an intersection, coming into an urban area. The project that we're working on uh, at US 20 Ward Hamby Road is designing and constructing a roundabout. Roundabouts are a proven safety countermeasure that reduce crashes up to 80%. Motorists, as they enter into town, they'll basically see a, a, a change in the traffic control. The, the alignment of the road will curve as they come in. This should 
slow people down as they come in um, and allow other traffic that's on the side streets to merge in safely and make the turning movements or straight crossing movements that they need to do. So the hope after the roundabout is constructed that we have a great impact on the severity and number of crashes that are occurring at that intersection and making it a lot safer than it is today. Anybody from Oregon in the room? Anyone? All right. Pick, pick the right um, video then. Um, <laughs> what'd you think of this video? Anyone? I mean, it's late. I'm going to let you have cocktails at some point. You liked it. Why did you like about it? Yeah. <laughs> Crashes. Yep. Yeah, and he had a real calm voice. He, he was confident. He had a lot of what uh, Elizabeth was talking about in, in, in the things that really mattered. That was a whole public involvement meeting in one minute long video. Everything that you would want in terms of the slides, but he started from a perspective, and it really started from the perspective of the people who you, who were, you were using, who were using the roadway, and the people who lived in the community. And there were issues that were raised. The state legislature increased the speed limit. We're trying to do, deal with that. The, there are movements of people. We're trying to deal with that. He got all of that in, but again, in a very personal way, a lot of the ways that Elizabeth was talking about earlier uh, a co couple of slides ago. So I know it may be a little bit of an extra effort, but as the Don Quixote uh, going toward the windmills and trying to uh, really help identify the hero in your story. Take the extra effort and think about the people who are using the system and think about what is it that they want to know and then overlay that with what is it that they need to know. And when you do the Venn diagram of that, you're gonna come up with what it exactly it is that you need to say in that moment. And that's what I think you should be leading your news release with, okay? Absolutely. Did, you, did everybody hear that? It, it, why it matters to them and, and what impact it has on their lives. So go ahead. I think we can go to some questions now if, if there are any at this point. I'm sure we've answered every single thing there is to know about communications at this point. Can you hear me through the mask? Um, I was just saying, um, wondering if you used this similar approach with your litter campaign, because you, it seems like you kind of personified litter, and I thought that was really clever. <laughs> yes, there were many elements to that sophisticated campaign. I don't know how many <laughs> saw the trash puppets <laughs> talking. <laughs> So, I mean, there were a few things going on there. Our target demographic, this, this echoed a couple of TikToks that were doing really well with the, our target demographic of males 18 to 34, who are our biggest offenders. Um, so part of it was just that we need them to look at it. I mean, in addition to needing people to like donuts, you like need them to know there's a donut shop. It's like a whole thing. But so that was part of it. And then it was also approachable to children. But the thing that you don't necessarily capture in the videos as well is the work that we did outside around that. So we had puppet shows at malls and we had some messaging that was related to specific quality of life um, concerns that had come up in Utah. We had some research that showed that um, the beauty of your built surroundings was the fourth highest factor and it was actually tied with the third. So a third highest factor influencing quality of life, although people did not rank it that way. So when you did the st statistical analysis, it came out really high. And so we were speaking to that with them in person. So the ads were kind of a hook to draw them in and because they were effective, we could get them to our longer form communications. Other questions? hear some of your thoughts on this um, when you said there's a whole public involvement meeting right in that video and it's true like if you you know an online public involvement meeting and you have that video and you ask the questions you're probably done you know 
And um, it took so long to go for us to start. Well, we always at Transcom and here we would talk about alternatives to the public meeting, but then everybody still had the in-person public meetings. And now I think things are going to change somewhat. So I wanted to see what you two had to say about that and what you've been thinking with this evolution after the pandemic. Okay, Lloyd is gesturing at me like I, I'm going to start this. Um, so kind of unrelated to storytelling, but related to thinking about our users, it was a necessity of the pandemic that we figure out some virtual options. And that is something that we had been pushing for in Utah for years, trying to figure out how to get the funding so that we could get the platforms for it. Um, and they've become a lot less expensive. But the thing that was really great is in addition to that technology becoming more affordable for us as a DOT, DOT, our users became really familiar with it. So it was comfortable for them to get onto a Zoom meeting or onto any online meeting platform because it's something that they were doing all day. Uh, and our presupposition for years had been that there were a lot of people who either had to work jobs, they had to work multiple jobs and just couldn't make it to meetings. There were people for whom, like me, that's really the only time, the time five to seven that a public meeting is often held is also the exact only time that I get to hang out with my son. And so I don't go to public meetings. Uh, so this was an opportunity for us to, to get in the door and that has worked really well. So just um, putting the word out and making that available. And I think, I need to double check the numbers. If you want exact numbers, follow up with me. But I think that we saw nearly four times the participation in our online meetings because people were also getting information online from the sources that would tell them, that could tell them that there was a public meeting. So that's been really, really successful. And we will not go away from that now. We've got the platforms in place. It's working great. So we'll do hybrids. I mean, you know, there are certain meetings that we have to do in person because of NEPA. But um, yeah, we're going to keep that going. It's worked really well. Yeah. And oh, I, I just think that everything that Elizabeth said is, is true. I've talked to, uh, just recently talked to some people at FHWA, and I said, where do you uh, see the whole online public meeting, virtual public meeting going? And there are some legislative requirements that, that require in-person meetings. And in, if there's one thing that we've learned from diversity, equity, and inclusion is that I may be comfortable with Zoom, but there may be communities that still aren't. And so therefore, like everything, when you introduce a new technology, you never eliminate the old technology. That's why we still have pencils, <laughs> uh, right? Because we have pens, but not only do we have pens, we have computers. So you don't ever completely eliminate the old technology. I don't think you're ever going to completely eliminate the in-person meeting. There's the humanness to it. I think there's a transfer of information. And by the way, what's the first thing that people do when they come in to a public meeting? What's the first board they go to? It's the map that shows where their house is or their business. So for as long as we're going to have public meetings, you're always going to have to have a map, and that's going to be the most important thing. So I'm going to run down and just pass this microphone over. Beth Hallmark, and I'm with the Texas Department of Transportation. This is a really great presentation, by the way. I love seeing it here at WASHTO. Uh, here's my question. So I'm curious about any examples you have of how you've used the story approach when you're in the middle of negative publicity, where you are already, as the DOT, the villain in the story. <laughs> so like most of the work we do is about. what you're talking about. So part of it is the acknowledgement of pain. I mean, part, part of it is acknowledging that you might be in the before state and helping people to look out and see what it can be, what it could be, to help them think about, I mean, even just going through the exercise of saying, what would another lane mean to me? And helping them see th what that's gonna mean for you is five more minutes, five minutes that you get home faster, or even better, this is how much faster you'll be going while you drive. Because five minutes doesn't feel like a lot, like to us when we're measuring, that sounds like a lot, but the difference between sitting in stop and go and driving even 40 miles per hour, that's huge in terms of how you feel. So knowing those metrics that are actually going to matter to them so that they can start thinking, okay, that is what we're working toward. It's Beth, still hard though. Beth, I'm glad you asked that question. And, and, uh, and I saw your hand over here, I'll, I'll come over. but. Um, so I'm still a reader of the Washington Post. I live in Phoenix now. I'm not in Washington, D.C. anymore. 
but um, in the last week, there have been two stories in the Washington Post, one out of South Carolina and one in suburban uh, Metro DC. And both of them have said, the state DOT is going to bulldoze a black neighborhood again. Both of them, the headlines, in their different projects, their different stories. So what I think is really important is this kind of storytelling has got to be done a lot sooner, and it has to be a lot more inclusive than perhaps what it is right now. So I'm not sure that I've got an answer for the situation that perhaps your DOT is in now, but if there's ever a sense of urgency in terms of strategic communications, I it's, it's now to rethink how it is that we're talking with the public. Social media wasn't enough. Uh, ten years ago, if you would have asked me, I said, social media is going to redefine how we have, re have relationships between our government and our public. I was right. It has redefined that. But I'm not sure that it's always in such a positive way. And, and that's, where, that's where I didn't see that coming. Hi, my name is Leah. I'm with David Evans and Associates. I'm a public engagement consultant. I would love to hear, I've written that press release like four million times, <laughs> so I would really like to hear you reword it, Lloyd, perhaps. <laughs> you want to run it back? Oh, she asked you to do it, not me. Yeah. <laughs> no, but can you run it back? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I would be happy to. Yeah, let's see if I can do this. Thanks, Leah. I appreciate this. This has put me on the spot here. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, okay. So one of the tricks, when we did the benefits report, this was a trick that we would do all the time, is we would look for where's the person, where's the human in it? The, you don't see anybody human until you get down to the quote from the chief executive. So the interstate is a major north-south corridor serving many communities. So I might have started with a key corridor serving the most important communities for the central region of the state will get a major upgrade that addresses safety and congestion uh, with the awarding of a, of a new contract. Something along those lines. You see what I'm saying? So, so that's usually the first key if you can go to the... In, in an old trick for newspaper reporters, too, <laughs> when the young reporters bring stuff... or editors, when the young reporters bring stuff in, go down to the bottom. Usually the best story is at the bottom. They write in a narrative, start to finish. Go to the bottom. That's the nugget. Pull that up, start there, and y inevitably you're, you'll have a little bit more to work with. All right, next question. Recently, I've been looking at some projects that would have uh, trade-offs between delay and safety. Um, for instance, changing left turn signals from protected permissive or vice versa. Um, how do you handle a project that may increase safety but inc also increase delay or reduce delay but maybe have some safety impacts? How, how would you handle those types of trade-offs? All right, is that Glenn? Glenn, is that the voice I hear? All right. So I think one of the things that is important to acknowledge here is that it's knowing who you're talking to, right? It's very situational. It, it better be. And so whatever the project is, I don't know which one we're talking about, but again, acknowledging pain, because in a situation like that where we're going to have to choose between two, we're going to choose one. It, we're not going to have it be a dead heat between the two of them and not move the, the needle on either very much. So we'll pick one. And then, like we were talking about before, we need to be able to articulate really well what that's going to mean, what that benefit is going to mean to the community and to the user in a way that is going to matter to them. And then we need to be able to acknowledge that there is a trade-off and explain, we felt that this is such a significant benefit to you. We've heard from you by talking to you and your communities that we know this is important to you. Um, and that's why we chose what we chose. So full transparency and then just laying out the decision. But it also points to the importance of us communicating with the communities and with our users so that we can feel confident that when we say we chose that because it's important to you, that they told us that we didn't assume. Yeah, Glenn, and I, I saw you over here. Um, 
I, I want to just suggest that the Oregon DOT uh, video that I showed was all about uh, speed versus safety. And, and as your communications consultant, hopefully, because I work for HDR now. Sorry, guys. Small uh, plug. Yeah. Um, no, but seriously, I would always say put safety over over everything else. Start with safety. You, you can't go wrong with it. But you've got to tell the story like this guy did. We're doing the roundabout because it's, you know, he's got all these things in there. So, all right. That was supposed to be funny. It wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> Uriel Sochamil with X Factor Strategic Communications based here in Utah. So you're treading on my turf a little bit there, Lloyd. No, just joking. <laughs> um, quick question. Like, so recognizing that data should complement your storytelling, right? Um, how do you quantify the benefits of a project to a communi community when it's kind of that granular level detail? It's easier when it's aggregated, right? When you're talking about kind of a large scale interstate project, but if you're talking about like a roadway widening through a, a community, then how are you kind of best able to quantify and communicate those benefits to the local community? So when you're talking, do you want to take a stab? I mean, it's you can't do like a, an economic impact statement on every project or you know <laughs> things like that. So, um, you know, and again, it's a complement to that storytelling. But those data points are so important, especially in today's um, you know realm of non-overlapping realities, where everyone's digesting their own information that kind of affirms their previously held beliefs or data points. How are we getting to kind of maintaining objective reality in our storytelling? Okay, I'll s yeah, you start, I'll add. Well, I think one of the things that you're, you're noting is that not everybody is going to have the same benefit from the, from the project. And, and unfortunately, the, for instance, in the Washington Post stories that I cited, uh, there are communities that are going to be perhaps affected by the um, desires of the, the departments of transportation to do some improvement works in, the, in those communities. Um, so I, I would have to say, ultimately, you're going to have to get down in the and make it personal and figure out what the story is for those people. They, they may never be happy about the fact that you're going to have to take some houses along an alignment or widen the road. Um, so I can't, I can't solve that problem for you unless I knew exactly what project it was, and then we could talk through maybe some strategies for addressing that. But I think it does recognize the fact that not everybody's going to see the benefits in the same way. Well, and I think that the difficulty in answering like what the, that response that I would need to know the situation, I think that is core to what we've been talking about. You know, know your audience is one thing and that absolutely is cardinal rule. But when you're building a relationship, you need to take the time to know who you're communicating with. And so I think that's like a whole other series of presentations about work that we need to do about how we engage in a real way and two-way dialogues with the public. And that means people who are using it, uh, individual people with communities, because a community mind is also different from the individual mind and then the local governments and people that and officials that represent that community. Because I think that what we need to understand is where are those concerns? We need to be able to hear what are you skeptical about that I'm gonna need to give you data for and where do you just not even care about data? You just want me to tell you yes, no, it will be better, it won't be better. But th that takes time and work. I'd be curious to hear um, your both of your perspectives on who's the right messenger Well, if it's one way, if we're doing push communications, I would say firsthand story always wins, that it trumps all. Hearing somebody who doesn't seem like Lloyd or me, who is trained to communicate to you, um, someone who just looks like they could be your neighbor, talking to you, and that would be complete with them, you know, repeating the same words or using phrasing that we would normally edit out of a professional communication. I think firsthand testimonial. There's a reason why it has been so tried and true in marketing for such a long time, because it resonates. Yeah, I'd, I'd have to agree with that. I, I think that the more um, you can get the actual um, non-politician, non-spokesperson to do the to do the message delivery. I, 
So uh, in the case of the roundabout, I thought that the local project engineer was the perfect person to talk about it. If I had to, if, you know, I cringed when he said impact on safety because I would never put impact and safety in the same sentence, but that's me as a communicator. But when he delivered it, it made sense and it was, it was authentic. Um, sometimes the news needs to be delivered by the Secretary of Transportation. I mean, you and I, we've been through that, it, that there are times where that just needs to be delivered and it needs to come from whoever the top person is and that person needs to be available for, for, for comment. But for a lot of this stuff, the more you can get the real, you know, the people in the field, the engineers in the, in the offices to, to be your spokespersons and to sort of be available and uh, be available to reporters. Media training is really important. Getting them comfortable talking to the public is really important. I think you're going to be better off. It's going to add a level of authenticity to your reputation with your public. Anything you want to share? No, I agree with that completely. Because those people really, really care. One of the things that I think we've done well at UDOT over the past few years is that we've got um, people in our region, so they're throughout the state, and they're working with the communities that are closest to them about planning. They're talking to them about planning because that's the person who's going to work through the master plan with them, and they can see that that person cares. They're trying to do the best job that they can possibly do, and I think that brings us full circle back to why it's important for all of our employees to be focused on well-being and the purpose of what we're doing because if they go in there trying to just explain what we're doing as a DOT or even what they're doing in their job, if it comes through that they're doing it because they love what they do, they believe that they're going to be doing good for the community, that lands a lot better than explaining the EIS. Yeah. All right, well, we can go to the last slide then, and that's just our contact information, and I think that we are, we are right on time, right, Joe? Oh, we got, we got three minutes. Uh, any last questions? All right. All right. Well, there we go. You have three extra minutes to get ready to catch the bus. But we'll be available to answer any questions if you need something afterward. Thank you very much. Thanks for being here, everyone.